Okay, it's 7.01, so we will get started and hopefully people will continue to trickle in as well. Um, so before we formally get started, I want you to all know that I'm going to record this session so that we can share this event with others. If you're uncomfortable with your thumbnail video appearing on this recording, please turn off your video now. And please mute your audio during the session or we may mute it for you. Um, but please turn on the chat function. Um, if you don't know how, you can hover over the bottom of your screen and there should be a chat button that you can click on. Um, or you might find something on the bottom that looks like a speech bubble and you can click on that. Okay. Good evening and welcome to Broadview's National Online Reading Club. My name is Emma Presswich and I'm Broadview's digital editor. Working behind the scenes to help me out tonight is Sharon Doran, who's Broadview's prom promotions manager. We're so glad you've taken, an out, you've taken an hour from your evening to be here with us. I see folks are doing this already, which is great, but if you haven't had the chance yet, uh, please let us know where you're from and who you are. This evening, we're going to hear from writer J. Nyla Avery and story subjects Helen Donnelly and David Hayward. In a few moments, I will introduce you to our thoughtful and fascinating guests. Just a few more notes before we start. After our speakers have told us a bit about themselves and their stories, please be brave and ask questions. There are two ways to do so. You can type, I have a question into the chat and I'll call on you as time allows. Then switch on your audio and ask the question. Or you can just type your question into the chat and I'll ask it for you. That's about it. So let's get started. Our first guest is Jay Nyla Avery. Jay is a non-practicing lawyer and black history scholar based, based in Raleigh, North Carolina, currently working in the tech sector. Uh, her piece for Broadview called A Portrait of Liberation explored her childhood experience with images of black Jesus and what portraying him as white means to African-American Christians. Please join me in welcoming Jay. Hello, everybody. Good evening. Um, can you guys hear me okay? Sure. Be a little bit louder, if you can. Okay. Is that good? A lot louder. <laughs> <laughs> Is that okay? Could be better. Okay. It's better than it was. Okay. I turned up my speakers, so hopefully that's okay. <laughs> that's wonderful. Thank you. Okay, good. Um, I'm Jay Naila Avery. Um, as Emma um, said, I, I am here in Raleigh. I'm a North Carolina native. Um, North Carolina is uh, <laughs> one of the most northern southern states uh, in the U.S., but we still um, are very southern here. Um, and I grew up in a in a uh, a Christian household, very religious household. Um, I grew up in a family of preachers. My grandfather was a preacher, and my my grandparents were civil rights leaders here in the state of North Carolina. Uh, and I am originally from the mountains of North Carolina. Um, so I grew up spending Saturdays at the Christian bookstore with my family. And fortunately for me, I grew up in an era where there was a lot of representation um, for me in all of the materials that, that I had, you know, my, my Bible and my Sunday school materials and all of that. I was very fortunate to grow up in a time where I did have that representation. Um, and so when I had the opportunity to write for Broadview um, about Black Jesus, um, you know, it's interesting because in my church and in my household, you know, we didn't know anything other than Black Jesus. That is what, you know, we, we grew up with. And those are the depictions of Jesus that I grew up with um, in, in my church and in my community. Um, and so I think it's, it's very interesting to kind of delve into the history of Warner Solomon's Jesus. Before this, I didn't realize that that image is the most reproduced image in the world. Um, and I, I thought it was very interesting to kind of dig into the history behind that, as well as the historical frameworks that uh, that, that image was born from. 
Um, and so in my research for this piece, I learned a lot about Warner Salman and, and just how that image came to be. And I thought it was very interesting to kind of juxtapose that um, between uh, kind of the, the two worlds. So my great grandparents, I, I mentioned my great grandmother's Bible in the piece a lot, and I have it here. Uh, this Bible is actually nearly a hundred years old. Um, and I'm very fortunate to have it, but you know, um, my great grandparents were sharecroppers. I don't know if y'all are familiar with the Southern system of sharecropping in the U S. Um, but it was basically slavery 2.0. Um, it was a way to continue to exploit the labor of African Americans and not pay them. Um, and so families would live on former plantations and they would work the crops and they would answer to the owner as uh, the owner of the land as, as though they were answering to um, an owner of a plantation, a slaveholder. Um, and so, you know, these landowners would, they would still, you know, impose violence against African Americans, they would still, um, you know, beat them just as though, just as how they, you know, plantation owners did during slavery. Um, and so I thought it was very interesting, kind of this juxtaposition between, you know, being a black Christian in, in my great grandmother's time and, and even in my parents' time and even now to, to, to a certain extent today, um, but especially then and being so committed to your, your faith as a Christian and, uh, you know, having a depiction of Jesus and having that depiction of a savior that you love and that you're committed to, but that depiction looks like the same people who are terrorizing you. Um, I remember as a kid, my grandmother and her siblings talking to me about a time where the KKK uh, burned down their barn and actually killed their livestock. And as a sharecropper, you know, your livestock, that was everything to you. And so, you know, the, those are the the day-to-day the -day interactions that they had with people who were white. And then they had, you know, on the other end of that, they had this depiction of Warner Salman's Jesus Christ. Um, so I think that's an interesting, you know, juxtaposition and um, just an interesting exploration about how to reconcile those two things. And so that's kind of how I came to share my story with Broadview. Um, in the 60s, there came the emergence of Black liberation theology. And so African Americans uh, these days, since the 60s, um, in church, we are taught based off of Black liberation theology. And so that is why me and my generation, we grew up with a different sense of our place within the religion of Christianity, um, within, from a theological perspective and standpoint. And we were able to, you know, really come at it from a place of liberation as opposed to coming at it from a place of oppression. And I don't know why I didn't think to mark it before um, starting, but there is a picture of Warner Solomon's Jesus in my great grandmother's Bible, many, many images um, of, you know, a similar, um, similar artwork um, within her Bible. And it's so interesting because she has notes written throughout the Bible, but on the photos where those pictures are, there are no notes, it's just completely um, so I thought that was very interesting. Absolutely, and thank you so much for, for sharing more about the background behind the story. Um, what I was wondering, your experience in your childhood was of seeing almost solely images of Jesus as Black. And there is now a reckoning with that popular image of white Jesus and conversations about having more representation. Um, what is it like for you to see people discover other representations of Jesus for the first time as someone who, who grew up seeing that? Well, uh, you know, it's something that um, 
again, it doesn't really, that's not my journey particularly, you know, because I don't know what it was like growing up with and connecting with a Jesus Christ who did not look like me. And so I think that is, you know, just from my experience and knowing what that is like and how that deepened my faith, I think that it is important to have that representation and, you know, for people to have those things available because, you know, obviously as Christians, we are supposed to be sharing the good news. And I think that anything that kind of presents a barrier to that, especially when we're talking about, you know, um, a barrier imposed by the frameworks that we have as humans, you know, the barriers that we erect as humans, I think that those should never be a deterrent from, um, from sharing the good news with other people. And so I definitely think that that representation is very important when it comes to, um, to showing people the, the love that is supposed to be at the foundation of Christianity. Absolutely. To expand on that a little bit, um, we know that Jesus wasn't white. We know that for sure, but if he was alive now, he likely wouldn't identify as black either. Um, I know you're likely not framing it in terms of a historical perspective of Jesus, but is, why is it important for him to be black as opposed to, to Arab? Uh, well, I think that, um, you know, and going back to some of the tenets of black liberation theology, um, I think that one thing that the theology is based on is kind of that identification between the journey of the Israelites of the Old Testament and the journey of African Americans, you know, from 1619 through now, um, with the beginning of the beginnings of the transatlantic slave trade. And so I believe that, you know, it is really important to kind of have that representation specifically for, for Black Christians because of the fact that so much of Christianity as, as has been expressed in America and kind of the roots of Christianity have kind of been rooted in white supremacy. You know, um, during the time of slavery, you had, um, they would bring their, their enslaved people into white churches and specifically have white preachers read to them the passages in the Bible saying that slaves need to obey their masters and that this needs to happen and that needs to happen and kind of cherry picking those particular scriptures. And so I think it's kind of a reversal um, of, of that, um, you know, kind of that deeply rooted white supremacy within the framework of the Christian, uh, foundation that we know it, know it as in this country. And so I would say that that's why, um, and I, I also think that just kind of bringing that empowerment as well, to the black community, particularly to us as black Christians. I think it's a, a form of empowerment. Um, and I think that it is, you know, something that has been kind of the catalyst for a lot of, you know, what we've been able to accomplish, particularly looking at the civil rights movement. If you look at the connection between black liberation theology and the civil rights movement, you know, it's very powerful. And so I think that depicting Jesus as a black man has kind of been that catalyst of empowerment. Um, and I, and I would say that for any, you know, any group of people. Um, but this is obviously specifically directed towards African Americans. Absolutely. I, I realize I, Ruth, you had a very similar question to me. Um, so I, Hopefully that answered your question. Um, Walter has a question. Walter, go ahead. Hi, yeah, I, I, uh, I have trouble with Jesus being God. And so, uh, but he was an amazing man. And I classify him in the same group as Martin Luther King Jr., who was also sent by God to us. And so uh, that maybe puts a slightly different angle on that. What would your response be to that? Thank you. 
Uh, well, for me, um, obviously I, I am a Christian. And so, um, you know, I, I definitely have that different perspective on Jesus Christ in terms of, you know, his, where his position, I guess, within the faith as well as, you know, within humanity. Um, but I, I definitely think that, you know, Dr. King himself taught from a perspective of black liberation theology. And that is what empowered his messages. If you listen to, you know, his message of, um, I've been to the mountaintop, those parallels come directly from the Exodus, you know, from the Old Testament and that parallel and that connection between the Israelites and, and African Americans. And so I can definitely see uh, your, your point, Walter, and kind of those parallels and how you would draw those things because Dr. King definitely drew upon a lot of that theology throughout his teaching. Um, two comments, one from Ray. Um, Ray says, we're all children of God made in his image, tasked to represent him and to share his good news regardless of color. Um, and Shirley is commenting on the, um, one of the other articles in our series on Black Jesus, uh, mentioning that it was written by someone who grew up with a white Jesus and still can't accept Jesus, even if Black, such damage done. Absolutely. I, I'm wondering, Black liberation theology, you described it, it was described very beautifully in your piece as a way to reinterpret Christianity with Black empowerment at its core and with Christ as the liberator of the oppressed. How can this theological lens bring hope to, to all of us, everyone who's watching what is going on in the US um, regarding the, the death of Dante Wright um, and the trial of Derek Chauvin? Um, well, I think that, you know, for, for anyone who, who, believes in, in Christ, whether you believe in him as the Messiah or as Walter was saying that he was an amazing man that had, you know, a lot to give. Um, at the essence of his teaching was, was love, you know, and loving thy neighbor as thyself. And, and I think that when you come at Jesus's, you know, messages from a perspective, perspective of black liberation theology, I think that what you can really take away from is that Jesus went out of his way to minister to the oppressed and to accept those people that society had cast aside. Um, you know, he was persecuted quite a bit for his association with prostitutes and with tax collectors and what those people deemed to be at the bottom rung of society. And if you're looking at society in a system where there is a, a caste um, and you have people that are on the bottom of that caste um, and, and particularly, you know, in a white supremacist system and, you know, the U.S. specifically, African-Americans have historically been at the bottom of that caste. And so I think that those teachings can be something that everyone can take in terms of um, you know, Jesus being the God of the oppressed and, and us kind of being his agents to be tasked with coming at society with that same mindset in terms of um, ministering and taking in and, you know, accepting people who society cast off and, and deems as, you know, deems a certain way. And, um, and I think that that's the difference as well between looking at things from a worldly perspective versus a biblical perspective. Richard has a question. Um, are there particular artists' images of Black Jesus that speak to you? Oh, um, <laughs> there, are, there are actually a lot. As I said, I, I grew up with, you know, surrounded by these depictions. Um, I would say that um, one of the artists that I, I really like, uh, his name is Leroy Campbell, um, and he's in Atlanta, Georgia, and he, his art focuses around African American life and culture, um, and there, he does a lot of pieces involving the Black church. Um, and Black Jesus is a part of that. And then there's a, there's a famous um, painting, uh, The Baptism. I can't remember who the artist is. Of course, you know, it's 
it's always one of those things where you know it until somebody asks you. So I can't recall his name right now. Um, but the, it, it's a very famous painting called The Baptism, and he actually does a lot of work with Black Jesus and with um, Black religious art as well. So that's been a great inspiration to me also. Debbie is wondering, Debbie, maybe you can expound on yeah. this a little bit. Um, so my perception of Jesus is everyone has a personal relationship. Um, it's very spiritual. And as our generations, 2000 years worth of them, have never seen the physical Jesus. So just take the thought that when Jesus appears to you, he appears to you personally. So if you're black, then he becomes black. If you're a Jew, well, we know Jesus was a Jew. And um, if maybe you're Chinese and maybe he appears to you in a Chinese form. Um, I don't necessarily think the conversation should be open whether Jesus was black or if Jesus was white or it should be more, how does Jesus appear to you? And that's all I wanted to add. Um, I, I definitely, um, I agree with you um, in terms of, you know, having your own personal relationship um, with Jesus. I think that that is, you know, underlying that is the most important thing. Um, however, when you are in a society where you are being persecuted and have historically been persecuted because of the color of your skin, um, I think it is very important to have these symbols of empowerment and what, what, what better symbol of empowerment than, you know, the person that you believe to be the savior of the whole world. And so I think that that is where the importance and the power comes in when it comes to the depiction of black Jesus. But, but it's, it's God who is salvation. Um, okay. So now we get into the religious context, but um, okay. So I'm, I'm, I'm going with it. You know, I mean, I think just Jesus appears to people as many nationalities. He's for all nations and um, is not really depicted per se in a physical sense. We don't have a picture of Jesus, so we don't know. You know, we can only go by how he appears to us. So I can go with a black Jesus. I mean, there's no problem with that. Um, that's not how he appears to me personally, but um, so I'm, I'm thinking, you know, I mean, hey, if Jesus is black, then that's fine with me. I mean, but I'm just trying to put it out like from a spiritual, you know, because I know <clears throat> I don't agree with what happened to the black people, but then I also don't agree with what happened to um, our first nations people either in Canada. And um, so that's, that's just the point that I'm trying to make. I mean, that be? Can maybe can we have some time after the discussion to there's so much that's coming out of this there's so many interesting questions about yes representation and the personal experiences of it um, yeah. and I know there will be more that comes out of this uh, so we'll have some time after our event when it finishes at eight to continue to talk about this and and Jay if you'd like to you're welcome to stick around and continue to have conversations about this. Awesome. Yeah. And I do want to say, I, I do understand what Debbie is saying for sure. 
<clears throat> um, and, and to that to that end, I do want to say that um, you know, with Warner Stallman's Jesus, you know, a part of that was weaponizing the, this you know image and this depiction of Jesus, and so that is where. Um, you know, not even speaking on it from a spiritual sense. And I wish we could just talk about Jesus from a spiritual sense, but because Jesus himself and Christianity has been weaponized and used as a tool to oppress African Americans, that is the conversation um, that, you know, that, that we're, I'm having in terms of uh, the depiction of Jesus as black. Okay. Yeah. Now that's not fair. What happened? You know what I mean? Like that should not have happened, but We'll discuss that at the end. Absolutely, lots of time for that afterwards. Um, we're gonna move on to uh, talking with our second guest, Helen. Um, Helen Donnelly has been a theater, circus, and the therapeutic clown for decades. Her appetite for teaching and training clowns for, for circus, stage, and healthcare led her to create North America's first certificate program for therapeutic clowning. She now employs her graduates through her nonprofit, Red Nose Remedy, while navigating a new cancer diagnosis. Sarah Trelevin interviewed Helen for her story, Bedside Laughter. Please join me in welcoming Helen. Hi, everyone. This is me. Um, coming to you live from Dundas, Ontario, which is, uh, for those unfamiliar with where that is, it's about an hour west of Toronto in Canada. And um, uh, I, I had a, a really wonderful uh, journey with Sarah Trelevin, who wrote the article about my work as a therapeutic clown in healthcare over um, the last couple of decades. And uh, it was a real honor to be chosen um, uh, to be featured. Um, she, small world, she was friends with my first therapeutic clown partner at Holland Bloorview Kids Rehabilitation Hospital, um, which houses uh, uh, children uh, from babies to teens um, with brain injury, um, multiple disabilities, um, multiple uh, muscular uh, skeletal uh, injuries, um, and the like. And I was employed there from 2007 to just this past um, fall uh, when cancer um, dictated that I had to hang up my nose for good, which is still an emotional um, toll on my, on my system. Uh, so, um, so Sarah Trelevin knew my first therapeutic clown partner at Hall and Blur View, um, and she contacted me and she asked if I was interested in um, in being featured. And I leapt at the chance because uh, there is so little known about this hidden art form. It is an art form, and those who perform within it are physical theater artists. So uh, when you think about maybe Patch Adams, you know, donning a nose to make a connection with, with the clients, that is not at all what we are and who we are. Patch Adams was a, a medical doctor who used uh, a clown nose and some, some, some props to make a connection. Um, he was never a trained theater artist like, like the rest of us are. So I just thought it was a great opportunity to shine some light on how it is that we train, what it is that we do, the fact that we're not imposing, but we're always asking permission. Um, she did a beautiful job in defining therapeutic clowning. Um, and uh, and it, was, it was a wonderful experience. Um, it's important to have those definitions out there because because it's such a hidden art form, we're, we're only, you'll only find us in, in healthcare situations. So you might find us um, when you yourself are hospitalized or a loved one is. Uh, but aside from that, um, we're, we're really sort of under the radar, as it were. Um, so uh, it was wonderful that she focused on 
my relationship with Jamie. Uh, he tragically died of a brain tumor in 2011. He was only 33 years old. And, um, and I myself have a diagnosis um, coming up on two years now of multiple myeloma, which is unfortunately an incurable cancer. And I've been given months instead of years. Um, so uh, it's, it's kind of strange that in one therapeutic clown program, you have two uh, cancer diagnoses among the clowns that worked there, but life is funny that way, I guess. Um, uh, so so the, the other thing that Sarah wanted to um, bring to light, as Emma mentioned, I, uh, in, inspired by Jamie, um, he and I would, would talk a lot about the future of therapeutic clowning in Canada, how to, how to further professionalize uh, and, and realize a, a school for therapeutic clowning. And so for about five years, I worked very, very hard building a school for therapeutic clowning. I, I wrote a 200 page student handbook about, um, about the, the art. Um, and it's, it's a really a marriage of science and art. Um, it's, where, it's where healthcare and art come together um, in a really beautiful dance, um, as it were. And uh, so although he died before he could see the result of his dream with me, um, I was really, really uh, honored and very, very motivated to create this certificate program, which happened in 2018 um, to 2019. It was a full school year at George Brown College here in, uh, over there in Toronto. And uh, it was, uh, the, 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 the therapeutic clowns um, learned how to develop two separate clown personas, one appropriate for pediatrics, and they used, um, we used uh, the, the clown doctor model. So their names might be Dr. Woosh, Dr. Radar, that sort of thing. Um, they would have colorful clothing and then, a, and then a, a, a doctor's coat on top of that to identify the, the, um, the parody of, of the doctor. Um, and that was done deliberately. And there, uh, the other persona is, is suitable for adults and elders in care. Uh, we, we, our intention is to serve uh, the entire age spectrum. And, uh, and the, the elder care clown persona, uh, they would wear outfits that were common in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. And this is for um, the, the purpose of of familiarity on behalf of uh, the, the clients that we're serving who are of an older generation, perhaps um, uh, suffering from dementia and, and the like, but they can, they can really appreciate the, the effort that goes into what we wear and how we um, present ourselves. Uh, so it was wonderful that she delved into the certificate program, um, you know, the program was not just artistic development, but a lot of about uh, self-care, a lot about um, uh, the medical uh, end of things, uh, what our clients are going through, um, what our clients are diagnosed with, how it affects uh, their, uh, their speech, their, their way of communicating, how it affects their emotions, um, and lots of Lots to do with um, uh, collaborating with healthcare staff. Uh, so it was a really wonderful opportunity to put all of the ideas into one school. And unfortunately, um, it may never run again. I, I would like to believe that it will, it will run again. Um, but I myself can't, cannot be at the helm um, because of my failing health. Uh, uh, so, uh, I, I wanted to uh, close by, by just saying, you know, 
thank you so much, Sarah, for uh, your interest in my career and, and, and in my taste for sharing best practice uh, and for um, giving um, me the opportunity to help educate the general public about this very hidden but vital service. Uh, we are a part of the healthcare team. We, um, we delight in, in being, um, you know, really uh, at the forefront of, of education and of research. And uh, uh, I, I, I think that's where I'll, I'll kind of leave it. So thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much, Helen. I have a question uh, from Ivan. Ivan is saying, he says, in the article, there's reference to working in hospital and seniors contexts. Are there other places where you think that therapeutic clowning would be especially useful? It's a great question because usually we, we get that, oh, I see you work for kids and you work for elders with dementias or anything else that you do. Um, yes, uh, we have um, worked in, um, we currently are serving Safe Haven, which houses um, children and adults with uh, multiple disabilities. Um, so the whole disability um, community could, could definitely benefit from our presence. Um, I would, I would say shelters for women and children is another um, huge uh, opportunity and we have been uh, serving there. Um, uh, um, uh, I would say um, uh, programs um, which house refugees uh, or, or people, um, you know, uh, who, are, who are struggling in, in a certain um, underserved uh, population. Um, but any, any, t any place where you can imagine you know, mental health is huge. I would love more th therapeutic clowns to serve in um, uh, hospitals for that specialize in mental health. So any, any um, population uh, deemed vulnerable, um, I think there's an opportunity there to offer some lightness and some joy and uh, a, a bit of uh, goofiness uh, because we all deserve to play. We all deserve to feel joy, and um, I, uh, I'll, I'll uh, leave it there. Uh, Michael has a question. Hi. Uh, music's mentioned in the piece, uh, and there are a few ukuleles floating around in photos. Um, so I'm wondering how common it is to employ therapeutic clowning and music therapy side by side, and where do you see the overlap and potential synergy between these disciplines? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I have collaborated often with music therapists. Uh, we've just happened to been in a maybe a knobs room where there's four beds to a room. They're serving one side of the room. We're serving the other side. And then we just pick up on each other's kind of vibes. And then, you know, we might be dancing to their music or, uh, you know, I might, I might do a desk cant on top of their harmonies and uh, so that sort of thing has happened. There have been other more um, formal collaborations um, that have undergone um, in, in the past, uh, but it, it, they are very, very, we, we, use, we use music in a very different way uh, than, than they do. Um, uh, it's hard to, it's hard to, to um, it's hard for me to really pinpoint what what that difference is, but they, their, their structure is very, very different. Ours is much less structured. Um, so we, we might stop, you know, a song halfway through to interrupt ourselves about some philosophical nonsense. Um, that, that doesn't usually happen with music therapy. Uh, they, their, their idea is to use music as a tool for empowerment and for communication with their clients. Um, we use music or we may not use music. We always carry a uke uh, around with us at all times, um, but usually it's on, a, it's on a string behind our backs 
it's just handy if if uh, if we feel uh, the the uh, the uh, the occasion calls for a made up song. Most of the time I would just make up songs. For some reason I just had a knack for making up songs. Music therapy, they I didn't I didn't get the sense that they make up songs a lot, that they come prepared with a sort of a set list. They go over the list with their clients, they agree on what song to to proceed with. Um, with us it's just kind of like I might I might be coming in with a song where where I'm like singing, like, I don't know where I am. I don't know where I am, you know, or whatever it is. And so it's a very, very different um, pr uh, proposition. But I love music therapists. And um, uh, the, other, the only other difference I wanted to highlight is that they are therapists. We are not. We are not a therapy. We are therapeutic clowns or healthcare clowns. And what we do has therapeutic merits. But we are not trained therapists like music therapists are. Music therapists have to study psychology. They have to get a degree in psychology. We do not. Hope that helps. We have a couple more questions that I think we may have to save for after the event. Um, if you have time to stay afterwards, Helen. Um, sure. I thought I'd highlight a couple comments. Um, one from Leanne. Uh, thank you for sharing this fascinating and wonderful form of healing. I work in a hospital and the traditional healthcare team is only one part. And Anne agrees. She says they need to be recognized as part of the healthcare team. I work in healthcare as well. Such a great article and thank you for sharing. And I agree with that. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks. We're going to move on to our final guest who also uses humor and playfulness um, to um, that he brings to difficult topics and situations. Um, after 30 years in the church, David Hayward left the ministry to pursue his passion for art. Naked Pastor uses words and images to challenge the status quo, deconstructs dogma, and offer hope for those who struggle and suffer under it. David is no stranger to belief systems. He holds a master in theological studies, as well as diplomas in religious studies and ministry, and university teaching. His art expresses the stories and struggles of spiritual refugees and independent thinkers who question, doubt, or oppose the confines of religion. Each piece encourages difficult conversations and acts as a catalyst for critical thinking. Sarah Jewell interviewed David for the Disruptor section in our April-May issue. Please join me in welcoming David. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me? Good? Good. Yeah, my name is David Hayward, uh, also known as the Naked Pastor. Thank you so much, uh, Emma, for having me on the show. And uh, so nice to see everybody. I think this is the largest group I've ever been a part of in a Zoom meeting, and I do a lot of Zoom meetings. So this is very impressive, and it's so good to be with everybody here. Um, so yeah, that introduction was a pretty good summary of who I am. Um, I'm living now in Quispam, Sis, New Brunswick. I'm not sure if you know where that is, but it's just outside of St. John, New Brunswick. Uh, I grew up in Toronto, in Newmarket, uh, in Ontario. And um, I didn't know much about the Maritimes then either. <laughs> but um, Now I've been living in the Maritimes for, for many, many years. Um, but I, I grew up in a Christian home. We went to many different churches. I started out being baptized as an Anglican, and uh, we traveled around to different um, denominations growing up. I ended up going to uh, Bible college, uh, then to seminary. I'm making a long story short because I know uh, we're running out of time. Uh, went to seminary, um, and then I... Uh, got ordained in the ministry in the Presbyterian Church in Canada and served the church uh, in the Presbyterian Church in the Maritimes uh, for many years. Then um, I, I left the Presbyterian Church and uh, I think it must have been in my bloodstream that I wasn't uncomfortable moving around denominations. And uh, I ended up in what was known as the Vineyard Church and was pastoring in a vineyard church. At around 2005, I, um, I, I had been blogging for a couple of years as a pastor, and 
I decided to take on the name Naked Pastor because I wanted to make my blog focus on, this is what's behind the name now. Um, I wanted to be very real and honest and transparent and vulnerable, as raw as I could be as a pastor. I wanted to sort of uh, let people see behind the curtain of what really goes on um, in the ministry. And I wanted them to see not only my, you know, my interactions with people and the joys and the comforts and the fellowship and the, you know, worship and, and all, all that, the theology and everything. I also wanted them to see my struggles and my, the conflicts and my, my doubts and fears and, you know, uh, what's, what it's like to be married and raising a family and the church as a man, all that stuff. I wanted them. So that's why I called myself the naked pastor. I, I was going to be real, no adornments. You're going to see the real thing. And, um, around 2000 and, five, I decided, because I'd already been an artist, I decided, why not try to use art to communicate what I'm trying to say? And I, I really like a good cartoon. I'm, I'm a watercolor painter mostly, and I do really nice landscapes and all that, but I decided I was going to try a cartoon. I'm a real fan of uh, like New Yorker cartoons, one frame, black and white. And um, so I decided I'm going to try to communicate through cartoons. and I, I was I challenged myself to do one a day, and I thought it might last a month. And here I am, 16 years later, still drawing cartoons. <laughs> and um, because they work, I, I, I was surprised at how popular they got so quickly. And um, I just really appreciated the power and effectiveness of a cartoon to deliver a, an impact. Uh, and elicit an emotional and uh, intellectual response so quickly. I mean, many people would come to my blog and maybe they might start reading a post that was a thousand words long and they'd get bored or disagree or whatever and scroll on by. But when you, you see my cartoon, it's like, it's too late. You've already seen it. It's a split second and um, the message is delivered. And so, uh, in about 2005, I started doing the cartoons, and that's when the trouble started. Um, when people started, I started to get recognized. My cartoons were being shared everywhere, and um, my denomination was starting to express concern in other churches and uh, different people, and, and I knew my time was up. One of the things I value very, very highly is personal freedom. And that's what I really encourage in, in my cartoons and everything. I, I really do emphasize, I'm passionate about personal freedom, that, that you have the right to be independent and self-determining and autonomous, and that you get to decide how to be spiritual. Um, and anything that, any ideas or people or systems that try to prevent that, or make that miserable for you, I will critique those. And so that's basically what I'm doing now. My, um, you know, that, and I decided in 2010 when things were, I realized even though I re really enjoyed the ministry and the church I was in was wonderful, we realized I was just, we know what we called it was we were no longer compatible theologically. And I, I felt it was time for me to move on in order to continue my own journey and also to let the church continue its own journey. And in 2010, I left the ministry. I did a brief stint as a, a teacher at a university, but then I decided to do Naked Pastor full time with my art and my cartoons and books and courses and things like that. And uh, it worked. So here it is, 2021. Um, and I've been doing this full time for about 10 years now. And I, I just love what I do because it's an integration of my spiritual side, theological side, my ministry side, my pastoral side, and my artistic side. And uh, I get to continue helping people uh, in virtually on, online rather than on a local congregation. So that's my, that's my story in a nutshell. Thank you so much, David. Um, Shirley is wondering this may or may not work with us technologically. She's wondering if you can show us a cartoon that is meaningful to you. I'd wonder if you have one around in a physical format. 
or if you could describe it to us and, and perhaps we can share it in the chat. Well, I would have to run and get a file and then everything and it would be disruptive, but uh, I can describe a couple. That would be great. Um, one of my most popular ones is there's a, a bunch of people with big fat pencils and they're, they're, they're using these big fat pencils to draw lines um, separating them from one another. But Jesus is in the middle of them with his pencil upside down and he's erasing the lines between everybody. And that's one of my most popular ones. It's called Eraser. Uh, basically, it's based on the idea that we might take efforts to divide ourselves and separate ourselves and distinguish ourselves. And uh, I think the underlying message of the gospel or one of the underlying message of the gospel is that there's now no dividing wall between us and that at a deep and fundamental level, we're one. So the picture where they're drawing lines and Jesus is erasing them is one of my favorites. Yeah. Douglas is wondering, um, with your oh, principles you. on freedoms, oh, yes, but um, he's wondering, with your principles on freedoms, do you yes. have a cartoon that would fit the Grace Life Church controversy in Alberta? <laughs> <laughs> well, you guys go right for the jugular. <laughs> I have a lot of cartoons about um, about personal freedom. Here's the thing, uh, and this isn't a bunny trail. Honestly, I'm not trying to deflect. If a community really does struggle with this question, and this is what I believe uh, I, I struggled with as a pastor when I was a pastor of a church, a community. Th this, to me, is a crucial question. How can I be free without violating or threatening your freedom? And how can you be free without violating or threatening mine? That is what a, a healthy community needs to wrestle with. Yes, uh, a community ought to be, in my opinion, a volitional gathering of, of liberated people. But that doesn't mean we just go around recklessly, selfishly, not caring about other people. We also assume responsibility. We're, we're, uh, we're um, authentic, but also accountable. And if we can do those two things at the same time, if we can wrestle with that question, how can I be free without violating your freedom? How can you be free without violating mine? That's what we need to wrestle with. So, you know, the, the, the controversies that are going on right now is, um, in my opinion, um, it's not just about personal freedom. It's about how to be free with others in community. That to me is a crucial question. Uh, Ray is wondering, have you published any books of your cartoons? Nine. Uh, that's not German. I'm sorry. I don't mean no. I mean, I've actually published nine, nine books. So, uh, and several of them are um cartoon books yes i keep i keep uh putting books out um some with ideas and uh, and illustrated with cartoons and some just cartoons and so uh and some of them are like my first bunch of cartoons and then some favorite cartoons and then one of my books is called questions are the answer and that's illustrated with cartoons entertaining the whole concept of how questions are helpful for spiritual growth and uh, and then I have another one, The Art of Coming Out, which are I have a lot of LGBTQ plus cartoons, and that book that book is for that um, that community, and so on. So yes, I have several books out, and they're all on Amazon, by the way. Wonderful. Um, Leanne says, when a message is presented is short and sweet and is effective at communicating its core meaning, then that's a success. That's absolutely the case with with your cartoons. And Don is sharing something. Is Don, is that one of the cartoons? Don't click on it if, before we know what it is. That's my, my stance. Is it one of one of David's cartoons? Don? Yes, it's, it's the cartoon that he mentioned. Oh, it is. Oh, wonderful. Well, that's great. Thank you so much for sharing that. that thank means, you. And thank um, you so much. Yes, go ahead if you have something else to add. No, no, go ahead. I'm sorry. Thank you. Oh, 
I was going to say that we should probably wrap up. Um, oh, okay. Unless uh, you have something else to add, then feel free. Okay, I have one more thing. The thing about my cartoons is, when you've seen it, it's too late. You've already seen it, and you can't unsee it. And some people are delighted by my cartoons. They enjoy them. Other people are infuriated by my cartoons be because they, cha it, they might challenge a particular theology or, uh, um, you know, a, a, a centrist idea or, or, or power or authority or uh, abuses or um, other things. So, yes, my cartoons, I think, you know, I, I do one a day, so they're not all good, but I have a few good ones. And they either, they do make an impact. They either um, encourage people or they critique uh, systems, ideas, or people. And, and um, so they just have an impact. I, don't, I can't predict which one it's going to have on people, but um, it can be positive or negative. Absolutely. Richard has a great question that perhaps um, if you want to stick around after David, we can, sure. we can address. Um, but I'm going to wrap up for, um, for the folks who are, are hoping to stay for an hour. Um, and thank you to all of you for being here tonight. This has been wonderful. Uh, thank you especially to Jay, Helen, and David who volunteered their time to make it possible. Uh, tomorrow we're going to be sending you a short survey by email so you can share your thoughts with us about this event. Broadview's online reading club is free and the costs to produce it are minimal, but if you'd like to help us continue to feature exceptional people like Helen and David and hire talented writers like Jay, Sarah Trelevin, and Sarah Jewell, please consider making a donation to our Friends Fund. You can go to broadview.org slash donate, and there will also be a donations link attached to the survey for your convenience. Broadview Reading Clubs exist across Canada. If you're interested in joining a local club or starting one of your own, please check out our page at broadview.org slash reading clubs. And if your club isn't already listed here, uh, please let us know so we can spread the word. When the event ends, um, I invite all those who are interested to stay on for an informal discussion, as I've mentioned. Um, otherwise, thank you so much for being here. I uh, hope to see you back here for our next event, which is on June 7th at 7 p.m. Eastern, where we'll discuss our June issue. Thank you so much and good night, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. That was great. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Emma, can we uh, uh, talk to yeah. these uh, to the guests now? Yes. Uh, those who have. Yes, uh, those who have decided to. I think Helen. I think David and Helen are still here. Um, Jay had to head out. Um, but she has left her email in the chat. So if you have a question or another comment for her, you can address it there. I'd like to talk to uh, Helen if I can. Yes. Hi there. Yes, uh, Helen, uh, I was most interested in the, the article in the uh, Broadview, uh, especially because I have done clowning myself, but from a slightly different angle. I have done it as a Christian clown. In other words, for worship services. And so I wondered, uh, or just was wanted to comment on the idea that the uh, particular art can be used in different situations. <laughs> and I have uh, had a lot of uh, interesting worship services completely done as a clown. I wondered if you had heard, for example, of Floyd Schaefer, who is, uh, as, is still doing um, uh, the Christian clowning. I have not heard of Floyd Schaefer, but I do, I, I am very familiar with uh, such a movement. Um, 
And uh, yeah, I agree with you. I think, I think clowning lends itself um, to be uh, used as a tool um, to communicate among many different uh, populations, uh, different groups. Uh, I myself am a happy atheist. It was always my dream to, uh, to, to build a, a troop of atheist clowns, <laughs> 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 mostly in response to a bunch of Christian clowns. <laughs> But, um, but yeah, that, that, that project never, never, never got off the ground, unfortunately. But, uh, but yeah, I, yeah I, I think that whatever your truth is um, and whatever your art is, art, art of any kind can do wonderful things to reach the population that you want to reach. Thanks, Thanks for your comments. There are other questions that folks didn't get a chance to ask. Feel free to ask them. Helen, Helen, I would just like to say that you were an absolute blessing and uh, whatever word you choose, if you don't want blessing, <laughs> um, an absolute inspiration and so important to my granddaughter at Blue View. Oh. You were wonderful. Oh, have, have we met? We have met. Yes. Oh, yes, yes. I, my, I have failing eyesight. I can't, I can't see any of you okay. very, very well. That's okay. So, yeah. um, my, daughter, what? my daughter was Emma and my, my granddaughter was Emma and my daughter is Christine. And oh, you know, oh. Very well too. <laughs> is your last yes. name Hill? Yes. Oh, yes. oh. oh. I'm still yes. in touch with Emma. And Christine. Yeah, oh, good. Yeah, good. yeah. They they contacted me when they heard about my cancer, and they they tracked me down on Facebook. And uh, yeah, it's it's been wonderful and wild to to um, to follow, you know, your former client and and see her as just a thriving, amazing young woman. So amazing, eighteen year old who we did not think was going to get there. That's right. No, no. and and I remember. So well, you came in at all the right times. Oh, <laughs> I'm so glad. Times were, yeah. times it probably would have been with my partner, Nurse Polo. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Manuel. The times, when, the times when something difficult had to be done, the clowns would come. Yeah. Yeah. We, we carry a pager with us and you guys would page us. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you. Oh, hey, I'm, I'm thrilled that I remembered you. Because, <laughs> you know, it's like thousands of clients and sometimes well, I know. I you just don't. don't. I but yeah, know. it's because they reached out to me that it's so, the memory is so fresh. Ah, nice to, nice to connect nice with to you. you. Thank you. Nice to see you. Yeah. Well, and I have a question. Is this part of a salaried position um, or yes. donations or how oh, does it work? Oh, yeah. Oh. No, no. We pay our artists very, very well. Yeah. Oh, great. Yeah, we do. I have a friend who is a clown at um, BC Children's Hospital, and uh, he's been doing it for years. And Paul, I think it's Paul Husen. Yeah, yeah, he's yeah. he's another fellow atheist. Yeah, he's. Uh, <laughs> he and I have been friends for two, like fifteen years. And he's uh, a clown lovely. full time, not just when he's at Children's. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, he's been at it since the seventies. In fact, Paul Husen, they think, uh, we we all think was the first clown doctor in the world. Oh, really? He, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I've uh, known him since the 80s, but um, Okay, yeah. yeah. You know, he started his practice in the 70s and he's a he's fantastic clown. Um, yeah. yeah, very well trained, amazing, inspiring human. Yeah, and I think he's still doing it as far as- No, I he officially retired a year and a half ago. Oh, he did, eh? Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's-, that's We're really still in fun. touch, yeah. yeah. Great. We all know each other, like across. Oh, good. Canada. Yeah. <laughs> and, and the global community is huge. There are thousands and thousands of professionally trained therapeutic clown artists around the world. And we get together every two years um, uh, for a conference um, somewhere in the world. And, uh, and that's where we can share best practice, uh, you know, really commune with each other, um, get really nerdy with uh research and um lots of lots of other great things so yeah i butt up against uh, a group of people heading to a con in a conference where you had red noses everywhere in the hotel <laughs> it was really crazy and they were a life-giving group 
Oh, I yeah. can't remember where it was. I just remember thinking you know, there's that many of them. Ah. Yeah. Do you know if Paul's position was replaced? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Melissa Aston and oh, okay. Sand Northrup. Great. Great. They Thank you. They made a hire. Yeah. Another hire. Yeah. Great. Good. A question for David um, from Richard, um, who says he regularly sees your cartoons posted on social media and has often wanted to ask about what you would make of the United Church and the ways it lives its faith. Can you, can you ask that again? I didn't quite catch it. Absolutely. Um, Richard says he regularly sees your cartoons on social media and is wondering mm -hmm. what you would make of the United Church of Canada and how it lives its faith. Well, first of all, uh, somebody asked about Larry Van Beek, and uh, is it Debbie Van Beek was asking about that? Yeah, um, we went to Bible college together. We were friends. Yeah, absolutely, and we're still connected oh. on Facebook. So, okay, because yeah. I recognized your name, and I thought, and when you said Newmarket, I thought, yeah, you knew Larry. Okay, so yeah, are, are you of the Pentecostal faith then? I used to be. Yep. Okay, and um, that was you, one of my. I, I call you myself Larry to the Pentecostal Church. I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah. that's amazing. Thank you so much. You're welcome. I call myself my own ecumenical movement because I've been everywhere. So, um, <laughs> and, and including the United Church. So here's the thing, uh, and we all we all know that about m and many denominations is that uh, every church is unique. So. You know, um, the Presbyterian Church uh, that I was a part of, um, you know, I felt comfortable there, although I knew there were other Presbyterian churches that I wouldn't feel so comfortable. Um, the United Church, uh, I knew uh, back in the day, um, had many friends there and studied with people who were studying to be ministers in the United Church in Canada. And um, friends with the United Church pastors and you know what I, I I just didn't feel a whole lot of difference between what we were doing and what the uh, United Church was doing although uh, the United Church where I mean where I was located I was usually in the country and th there was um, uh, tended to be more conservative but um, I appreciated the United Church's efforts to become more and more affirming sooner and uh, I, I, which I totally wholeheartedly agree with and appreciate. So um, that's, that's my idea about the United Church is that it's just made up of a whole bunch of diversity, which, uh, but I do appreciate the fact that it, it, it does, um, in my opinion, um, lead the way in many pro more progressive ideas and theology than, than I was, um, the churches I was in at that time. Got a question for, for David there, actually. Hi, Michael. Hi. Um, I think you talk about it in the piece a little bit, that religion is this idea that's often, or the subject that's often held, sort of, you, you can't really poke fun at it, or, or there's a bit of thinking about it like that. and. I'm wondering if, I guess this is a bit rhetorical really, but why do you think this is the case for something where people ostensibly have such strong convictions? I mean, if people are so sure of something, shouldn't that make them less concerned about critique or, or levity at some level? Mm -hmm. um, well, you, you might think so. <laughs> um, uh, one of my cartoons uh, says the truth can uh, is stronger than you. It can handle your questions. And um, I, I just learned very early in my own life that uh, questions were uh, an effective way to um, keep your mind open and to continue to grow uh, theologically, philosophically, spiritually. And when I say spiritual, I know there, um, uh, that doesn't I'm not necessarily invoking a divinity. When I say spiritual, I mean uh, the inner life of a person. And uh, so I, I've always believed that critique is important. It's like they say in science, 
everything has to be false, falsifiable. All, all discoveries, they agree, need to be falsifiable. That way, it, you're not afraid of challenging the status quo or, you know, um, the strong, more centrist or popular ideas. They constantly research has to be done. And I think the same thing ought to be done theologically and religiously and ecclesiologically as well, that we constantly need to be renewing and um, challenging the status quo in order that we can um, progress and move on and grow. Ivan has a, a connecting comment. Uh, he says, it's often struck me that people who cannot laugh at themselves should not not be taken seriously. A sense of humor to indicate an ability to experience a depth of feeling. Am I wrong? <laughs> not wrong. <laughs> 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 yeah, I find uh, what that's one of the things I enjoy about a good cartoon. Um, I, I, I already mentioned the New Yorker or like the far side or, you know, these one frame cartoons. Uh, I really love the power of them because they will bypass your intellectual defenses and, and go straight for your heart so that when, for example, I show a picture of Jesus carrying a rainbow sheet lovingly, um, it does something to some people. And I'm thrilled to be able to say that some of my cartoons have changed people's minds about how they think or feel about um, their gay friends or a transgender person or, you know, so it, to me, I, I, I just love that ability of art in general to go straight for your feelings, your, uh, to evoke an emotional response that maybe sometimes might encourage your intellect or undermine your intellect and i think that's a really cool feature of art certainly thanks unless there are more comments or questions we will wrap up thank you so much everyone thank you emma oh eric thank you emma so much i think thank eric, you oh, one oh, more question yeah, yeah. uh, eric yeah, sorry i missed there that's okay. Thank you. Uh, I had a question for each of the remaining guests. The, the question for uh, Helen uh, was, uh, and, and this is a serious question. Uh, I know someone who claims to have a fear of clowns. And uh, I think there's a famous Seinfeld episode involving uh, the fear of clowns. Uh, yeah, that was Kramer. a good episode. Yeah. Uh, it, do you know, is this a legitimate phobia? Are there people who are honestly afraid of clowns that you've encountered? Yeah. So. Um, Briefly, yeah, it's called colorophobia. It is in the uh, uh, book of, uh, of you know, uh, diseases that, um, that have been identified and, and disorders. So uh, yes, it's, it, is, it is a legitimate phobia. However, it only affects like 0.002% of the population. And so you'll most often hear people claim loudly, I, I'm afraid of clowns, they freak me out. They don't mean I have a legitimate case of colorophobia. <laughs> what they mean is they, my interpretation is they, they despise the kind of clowns I despise, which are the ones that are undertrained, uh, maybe the fright clown whole you know, genre, not, I'm not a big fan of it. Um, it's not anything that I recognize as clown. Uh, so it's, it's, it's that kind of the illegitimate wing of my art form that has been um, appropriated by people not in the know. So hopefully that answers your question. A lot of people that uh, read Stephen King and his, yeah, I mean, <clears throat> his, his movie It. I mean, yeah. wouldn't, wouldn't you fear clowns too? <laughs> well, that, that again, that, that's not a clown. Like, that's not how I, de de how I define clown. It's no. a monster with a clown nose. That doesn't make it a clown. A, a clown is more than the nose. 
it's oh, more no, than they're so cheerful and happy and well i, I would actually joy. i would actually um push back and say that clown embraces all emotions it's just as freaky for me to have a a a a, a, a stubbornly cheerful clown that that ignores uh life's pains and ignores um the complexity of our emotions i i would fear such a clown i would fear a clown who is forcefully cheerful and forcing their their sunniness <laughs> onto people um who are not prepared to receive it i i would fear such a clown That's so uh yeah i i i only i only trust clowns who are properly trained and who have had lots of experience uh, with, with people who are grounded, who are amazing artists, who are great listeners, who are intuitive thinkers. Um, these are the kind of clowns that I, I'm interested in engaging with. Uh, thank you very much, Helen. And uh, the question for David was, uh, you mentioned Vineyard. And were you referring to Vineyard Christian Fellowship or to something else? And, and can you tell me a bit more about the Vineyard uh, Church? I, I don't know anything about it. Yeah, just in a nutshell, the Vineyard Church uh, is a movement that began in California under John Wimber. And it was sort of a mixture of evangelical and Pentecostal, evangelical in theology and sort of Pentecostal style in worship. It was very modern, you know, uh, relaxed dress, um, progressive music, you know, um, more cultural appropriate and things like that. And, and so, uh, that's where I ended up. Yeah. But that's where I also left the ministry in 2010. Thank you. And there's been your churches across, are you in Canada, Eric? Yes, I'm in Toronto. Yeah. So there's been your churches in, uh, Ontario and Toronto and, and so forth. Mm -hmm. Yep. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Thanks, Emma. Thank you, Emma. Thanks, Thanks you, Emma. Emma. Enjoy Thanks, the rest Emma. of your week. Bye bye. 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 Thank you, everyone. Remain fans of Broadview. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>